Book four, part one of the Republic by Plato. Read by Bob Neufeld. Here Adamantus interposed a question. How would you answer, Socrates, said he, if a person were to say that you are making these people miserable, and that they are the cause of their own unhappiness? The city, in fact, belongs to them, but they are none the better for it, whereas other men acquire lands, and build large and handsome houses, and have everything handsome about them, offering sacrifices to the gods on their own account, and practicing hospitality. Moreover, as you were saying just now, they have gold and silver, and all that is usual among the favorites of fortune. But our poor citizens are no better than mercenaries, who are quartered in the city, and are always mounting guard. Yes, I said, and you may add that they are only fed, and not paid in addition to their food, like other men. And therefore they cannot, if they would, take a journey of pleasure. They have no money to spend on a mistress, or on any luxurious fancy, which, as the world goes, is thought to be happiness, and many other accusations of the same nature might be added. But, said he, let us suppose all this to be included in the charge. You mean to ask, I said, what will be our answer? Yes. If we proceed along the old path, my belief, I said, is that we shall find the answer. And our answer will be that, even as they are, our guardians may very likely be the happiest of men. But our aim in founding the state was not the disproportionate happiness of any one class, but the greatest happiness of the whole. We thought that in a state which is ordered with a view to the good of the whole, we should be most likely to find justice, and having found them, we might then decide which of the two is the happier. At present, I take it, we are fashioning the happy state, not piecemeal, or with a view of making a few happy citizens, but as a whole, and by and by we will proceed to view the opposite kind of state. Suppose that we were painting a statue, and someone came up to us and said, Why do you not put the most beautiful colors on the most beautiful parts of the body? The eyes are to be purple, but you have made them black. To him we might fairly answer, Sir, you would not surely have us beautify the eyes to such a degree that they are no longer eyes. Consider rather whether, by giving this or the other features their due proportion, we make the whole beautiful. And so I say to you, do not compel us to assign to the guardians a sort of happiness which will make them anything but guardians, for we too can clothe our husbandmen in royal apparel, and set crowns of gold on their heads, and bid them till the ground as much as they like, and no more. Our potters also might be allowed to repose on couches, and feast by the fireside, passing round the wine-cup, while their wheel is conveniently at hand, and working at pottery only as much as they like. In this way we might make every class happy, and then, as you imagine, the whole state would be happy. But do not put this idea into our heads. For if we listen to you, the husbandman will be no longer a husbandman, the potter will cease to be a potter, and no one will have the character of any distinct class in the state. Now this is not of much consequence, where the corruption of society, and pretension to be what you are not, is confined to cobblers. But when the guardians of the laws and of the government are only seeming, and not real guardians, then see how they turn the state upside down and on the other hand, they alone have the power of giving order and happiness to the state. We mean our guardians to be true saviors, and not the destroyers of the state, whereas our opponent is thinking of peasants at a festival, who are enjoying a life of revelry, not of citizens who are doing their duty to the state. But if so, we mean different things, and he is speaking of something which is not a state, and therefore we must consider whether in appointing our guardians we would look to their greatest happiness individually, or whether this principle of happiness does not rather reside in the state as a whole. But if the latter be the truth, then the guardians and auxiliaries, and all others equal with them, must be compelled or induced to do their own work in the best way. 
and thus the whole state will grow up in a noble order, and the several classes will receive the proportion of happiness which nature assigns to them. I think that you are quite right. I wonder whether you will agree with another remark which occurs to me. What might that be? There seem to be two causes of the deterioration of the arts. What are they? Wealth, I said, and poverty. How do they act? The process is as follows. When a potter becomes rich, will he, think you, any longer take the same pains with his art? Certainly not. He will grow more and more indolent and careless. Very true. And the result will be that he becomes a worse potter. Yes, he greatly deteriorates. But, on the other hand, if he has no money, and cannot provide himself with tools or instruments, he will not work equally well himself, nor will he teach his sons or apprentices to work equally well. Certainly not. Then, under the influence either of poverty or of wealth, workmen and their work are equally liable to degenerate. That is evident. Here, then, is a discovery of new evils, I said against which the guardians will have to watch, or they will creep into the city unobserved. What evils? Wealth, I said, and poverty. The one is the parent of luxury and indolence, and the other of meanness and viciousness, and both of discontent. That is very true, he replied, but still I should like to know, Socrates, how our city will be able to go to war, especially against an enemy who is rich and powerful, if deprived of the sinews of war. There would certainly be a difficulty, I replied, in going to war with one such enemy, but there is no difficulty where there are two of them. How so? he asked. In the first place, I said, if we have to fight, our side will be trained warriors fighting against an army of rich men. That is true, he said. And do you not suppose, Adamantus, that a single boxer who was perfect in his art would easily be a match for two stout and well-to-do gentlemen who were not boxers? Hardly, if they came upon him at once. What now, I said, if we were able to run away and then turn and strike at the one who first came up, and supposing he were to do this several times under the heat of a scorching sun, might he not, being an expert, overturn more than one stout personage? Certainly, he said. There would be nothing wonderful in that. And yet rich men probably have a greater superiority in the science and practice of boxing than they have in military qualities. Likely enough. Then we may assume that our athletes will be able to fight with two or three times their own number. I agree with you, for I think you're right. And supposing that before engaging, our citizens send an embassy to one of the two cities, telling them what is the truth. Silver and gold we neither have nor are permitted to have, but you may. Do you, therefore, come and help us in war, and take the spoils of the other city? Who, on hearing these words, would choose to fight against lean, wiry dogs, rather than, with the dogs on their side, against fat and tender sheep? That is not likely, and yet there might be a danger to the poor state if the wealth of many states were to be gathered into one. But how simple of you to use the term state at all of any but our own! Why so? You ought to speak of other states in the plural number. Not one of them is a city, but many cities, as they say in the game. For indeed any city, however small, is in fact divided into two one the city of the poor, the other of the rich. These are at war with one another, and in either there are many smaller divisions, and you would be altogether beside the mark if you treated them all as a single state. But if you deal with them as many, and give the wealth or power or persons of one to the others, you will always have a great many friends, and not many enemies. And your state, while the wise order which has now been prescribed continues to prevail in her, will be the greatest of states, I do not mean to say in reputation or appearance, but in deed and truth, though she number not more than a thousand defenders. A single state which is her equal you will hardly find, either among Hellenes or barbarians, though many that appear to be as great, and many times greater. That is most true, he said. 
and what i said will be the best limit for our rulers to fix when they are considering the size of the state and the amount of territory which they are to include and beyond which they will not go what limit would you propose i would allow the state to increase so far as is consistent with unity that i think is the proper limit very good he said here then i said is another order which will have to be conveyed to our guardians let our city be accounted neither large nor small but one and self-sufficing and surely said he this is not a very severe order which we impose upon them and the other said i of which we were speaking before is lighter still i mean the duty of degrading the offspring of the guardians when inferior and of elevating into the rank of guardians the offspring of the lower classes when naturally superior the intention was that in the case of the citizens generally each individual should be put to the use for which nature intended him one to one work and then every man would do his own business and be one and not many and so the whole city would be one and not many yes he said that is not so difficult the regulations which we are prescribing my good adamantus are not as might be supposed a number of great principles but trifles all if care be taken as the saying is of the one great thing a thing however which i would rather call not great but sufficient for our purpose what may that be he asked education i said and nurture if our citizens are well educated and grow into sensible men they will easily see their way through all these as well as other matters which i omit such for example as marriage the possession of women and the procreation of children which will all follow the general principle that friends have all things in common as the proverb says that will be the best way of settling them also i said the state if once started well moves with accumulating force like a wheel for good nurture and education implant good constitutions and these good constitutions taking root in a good education improve more and more and this improvement affects the breed in man as in other animals very possibly he said then to sum up this is the point to which above all the attention of our rulers should be directed that music and gymnastic be preserved in their original form and no innovation made they must do their utmost to maintain them intact and when any one says that mankind must regard the newest song which the singers have they will be afraid that he may be praising not new songs but a new kind of song and this ought not to be praised or conceived to be the meaning of the poet for any musical innovation is full of danger to the whole state and ought to be prohibited so damon tells me and i can quite believe him he says that when modes of music change the fundamental laws of the state always change with them yes said adamantus and you may add my suffrage to damon's and your own then i said our guardians must lay the foundations of their fortress in music yes he said the lawlessness of which you speak too easily steals in yes i replied in the form of amusement and at first sight it appears harmless why yes he said and there is no harm were it not that little by little this spirit of license finding a home imperceptibly penetrates into manners and customs whence issuing with greater force it invades contracts between man and man and from contracts goes on to laws and constitutions in utter recklessness ending at last socrates by an overthrow of all rights private as well as public is that true i said that is my belief he replied then as i was saying our youth should be trained from the first in a stricter system for if amusements become lawless and the youths themselves become lawless they can never grow up into well-conducted and virtuous citizens very true he said and when they have made a good beginning in play and by the help of music have gained the habit of good order then this habit of order in a manner how unlike the lawless play of the others 
will accompany them in all their actions, and be a principle of growth to them, and if there be any fallen places in the state, will raise them up again. Very true, he said. Thus educated, they will invent for themselves any lesser rules which their predecessors have altogether neglected. What do you mean? I mean such things as these, when the young are to be silent before their elders, how they are to show respect to them by standing and making them sit, what honour is due to parents, what garments or shoes are to be worn, the mode of dressing the hair, deportment and manners in general. You would agree with me? Yes. But there is, I think, small wisdom in legislating about such matters. I doubt if it is ever done, nor are any precise written enactments about them likely to be lasting. Impossible. It would seem, Madamantus, that the direction in which education starts a man will determine his future life. Does not like always attract like? To be sure until some one rare and grand result is reached which may be good, and may be the reverse of good. That is not to be denied. And for this reason, I said, I shall not attempt to legislate further about them. Naturally enough, he replied. Well, and about the business of the agora, and the original dealings between man and man, or again about agreements with artisans, about insult and injury, or the commencement of actions and the appointment of juries, what would you say? There may also arise questions about any impositions and exactions of market and harbour dues which may be required, and in general about the regulations of markets, police, harbours, and the like. Oh, heavens, shall we condescend to legislate on any of these particulars? I think, he said, that there is no need to impose laws about them on good men. What regulations are necessary they will find out soon enough for themselves. Yes, I said, my friend, if God will only preserve to them the laws which we have given them. And without divine help, said Adimantus, they will go on forever making and bending their laws and their lives in the hope of attaining perfection. You would compare them, I said, to those invalids who, having no self-restraint, will not leave off their habits of intemperance? Exactly. Yes, I said, and what a delightful life they lead. They are always doctoring and increasing and complicating their disorders, and always fancying that they will be cured by any nostrum which anybody advises them to try. Some cases are very common, he said, with invalids of this sort. Yes, I replied, and the charming thing is that they deem him their worst enemy who tells them the truth, which is simply that unless they give up eating and drinking and wenching and idling, neither drug nor cautery nor spell nor amulet nor any other remedy will avail. Charming, he replied, I see nothing charming in going into a passion with a man who tells you what is right. These gentlemen, I said, do not seem to be in your good graces. Uh, assuredly not. Nor would you praise the behaviour of states which act like the men whom I was just now describing, for are there not ill-ordered states in which the citizens are forbidden under pain of death to alter the constitution, and yet he who most sweetly courts those who live under this regime, and indulges them, and fawns upon them, and is skilful at anticipating and gratifying their humours, is held to be a great and good statesman. Do not these states resemble the persons whom I was describing? Yes, he said, the states are as bad as the men, and I am very far from praising them. But do you not admire, I said, the coolness and dexterity of these ready ministers of political corruption? Yes, he said, I do, but not for all of them, for there are some whom the applause of the multitude has deluded into the belief that they are really statesmen and these are not much to be admired. What do you mean? I said. You should have more feeling for them. When a man cannot measure, and a great many others who cannot measure declare that he is four cubits high, can he help believing what they say? Nay, he said, certainly not in that case. Well, then, do not be angry with them. For are they not as good as a play, trying their hand at paltry reforms such as I was describing, 
They are always fancying that by legislation they will make an end of fraudulent contracts and the other rascalities which I was mentioning, not knowing that they are in reality cutting off the heads of the Hydra. Yes, he said, that is just what they are doing. I conceive, I said, that the true legislator will not trouble himself with this class of enactments, whether concerning laws or the Constitution, either in an ill-ordered or in a well-ordered state. For in the former they are quite useless, and in the latter there will be no difficulty in devising them, and many of them will naturally flow out of our previous regulations. What, then, he said, is still remaining to us of the work of legislation? Nothing to us, I replied, but to Apollo, the god of Delphi, there remains the ordering of the greatest and noblest and chiefest things of all. Which are they? he said. The institution of temples and sacrifices, and the entire service of gods, demigods, and heroes. Also the ordering of the repositories of the dead, and the rites which have to be observed by him who would propitiate the inhabitants of the world below. These are matters of which we are ignorant ourselves, and as founders of a city we should be unwise in trusting them to any interpreter but our ancestral deity. He is the god who sits in the centre, on the navel of the earth, and he is the interpreter of religion to all mankind. You are right, and we will do as you propose. But where, amid all this, is justice? Son of Ariston, tell me where. Now that our city has been made habitable, light a candle and search, and get your brother and Polymarchus and the rest of our friends to help and let us see where in it we can discover justice, and where in justice, and in what they differ from one another, and which of them the man who would be happy should have for his portion, whether seen or unseen by gods and men. Nonsense, said Glaucon. Did you not promise to search yourself, saying that for you not to help justice in her need would be an impiety? I do not deny that I said so, and as you remind me, I will be as good as my word. But you must join. We will, he replied. Well, then, I hope to make a discovery in this way. I mean to begin with the assumption that our state, if rightly ordered, is perfect. That is most certain and being perfect is therefore wise and valiant and temperate and just that is likewise clear and whichever of these qualities we find in the state the one which is not found will be the residue well, very good if there were four things and we were searching for one of them wherever it might be the one sought for might be known to us from the first and there would be no further trouble or we might know the other three first, and then the fourth would be clearly the one left. Very true, he said. And it's not a similar method to be pursued about the virtues, which are also four in number. Clearly. First among the virtues found in the state, wisdom comes into view, and in this I detect a certain peculiarity. What is that? The state which we have been describing is said to be wise as being good in counsel, very true, and good counsel is clearly a kind of knowledge, for not by ignorance but by knowledge do men counsel well, clearly. And the kinds of knowledge in a state are many and diverse? Of course. There is the knowledge of the carpenter, but is that the sort of knowledge which gives a city the title of wise and good in counsel? Certainly not. That would only give a city the reputation of skill in carpentering. That a city is not to be called wise because possessing a knowledge which counsels for the best about wooden implements? Certainly not. Nor by reason of a knowledge which advises about brazen pots, I said, nor as possessing any other similar knowledge. Not by reason of any of them, he said. Nor yet by reason of a knowledge which cultivates the earth. That would give the city the name of agricultural. Yes. Well, I said. And is there any knowledge in our recently founded state among any of the citizens which advises not about any particular thing in the state, but about the whole, and considers how a state can best deal with itself and with other states? There certainly is. And what is this knowledge, and among whom is it found? I asked. 
Uh, it is the knowledge of the guardians he replied and is found among those whom we were just now describing as perfect guardians and what is the name which the city derives from the possession of this sort of knowledge the name of good in counsel and truly wise and will there be in our city more of these true guardians or more smiths the smiths he replied will be far more numerous will not the guardians be the smallest of all the classes who receive a name from the profession of such kind of knowledge much the smallest and so by reason of the smallest part or class and of the knowledge which resides in this presiding and ruling part of itself the whole state being thus constituted according to nature will be wise and this which has the only knowledge worthy to be called wisdom has been ordained by nature to be of all classes the least most true thus then i said the nature and place in the state of one of the four virtues has somehow or other been discovered and in my humble opinion very satisfactorily discovered he replied again i said there is no difficulty in seeing the nature of courage and in what part that quality resides which gives the name of courageous to the state well, how do you mean why i said every one who calls any state courageous or cowardly will be thinking of the part which fights and goes to war on the state's behalf no one he replied would ever think of any other the rest of the citizens may be courageous or may be cowardly but their courage or cowardice will not as i conceive have the effect of making the city either the one or the other certainly not the city will be courageous in virtue of a portion of herself which preserves under all circumstances that opinion about the nature of things to be feared and not to be feared in which our legislator educated them and this is what you term courage i should like to hear what you are saying once more for i do not think that i perfectly understand you i mean that courage is a kind of salvation salvation of what of the opinion respecting things to be feared what they are and of what nature which the law implants through education and i mean by the words under all circumstances to intimate that in pleasure or in pain or under the influence of desire or fear a man preserves and does not lose his opinion shall i give you an illustration if you please you know i said that dyers when they want to dye wool for making the true sea purple begin by selecting their white colour first this they prepare and dress with much care and pains in order that the white ground may take the purple hue in full perfection the dyeing then proceeds and whatever is dyed in this manner becomes a fast colour and no washing either with lies or without them can take away the bloom but when the ground has not been duly prepared you will have noticed how poor is the look either of purple or of any other colour yes he said i know that they have a washed out and ridiculous appearance then now i said you will understand what our object was in selecting our soldiers and educating them in music and gymnastic we are contriving influences which would prepare them to take the dye of the laws in perfection and the colour of their opinion about dangers and of every other opinion was to be indelibly fixed by their nurture and training not to be washed away by such potent lies as pleasure mightier agent far in washing the soul than any soda or lye or by sorrow fear and desire the mightiest of all other solvents and this sort of universal saving power of true opinion in conformity with law about real and false dangers i call and maintain to be courage unless you disagree but i agree he replied for i suppose that you mean to exclude more uninstructed courage such as that of a wild beast or a slave this in your opinion is not the courage which law ordains and ought to have another name most certainly then i may infer courage to be such as you describe why yes said i you may and if you add the words of a citizen you will not be far wrong hereafter if you like we will carry the examination further but at present we are seeking not for courage but justice and for the purpose of our inquiry we have said enough 
"'You are right,' he replied. Two virtues remain to be discovered in the state, first temperance, and then justice, which is the end of our search. Very true. Now, can we find justice without troubling ourselves about temperance? I do not know how that could be accomplished, he said, nor do I desire that justice should be brought to light and temperance lost sight of, and therefore I wish that you would do me the favor of considering temperance first. Certainly, I replied, I should not be justified in refusing your request. Then consider, he said. Yes, I replied, I will. And as far as I can at present see, the virtue of temperance has more of the nature of harmony and symphony than the preceding. How so? he asked. Temperance, I replied, is the ordering or controlling of certain pleasures and desires. This is curiously enough implied in the saying of a man being his own master, and other traces of the same notion may be found in language. No doubt, he said, there is something ridiculous in the expression master of himself, for the master is also the servant, and the servant the master, and in all these modes of speaking the same person is denoted. Certainly. The meaning is, I believe, that in the human soul there is a better and also a worse principle, and when the better has the worse under control, then a man is said to be master of himself, and this is a term of praise. But when, owing to evil education or association, the better principle, which is also the smaller, is overwhelmed by the greater mass of the worse, in this case he is blamed, and is called the slave of self and unprincipled. Yes, there is reason in that. And now, I said, look at our newly created state, and there you will find one of these two conditions realized, for the state, as you will acknowledge, may be justly called master of itself, if the words temperance and self-mastery truly express the rule of the better part over the worse. Yes, he said, I see that what you say is true. Let me further note that the manifold and complex pleasures and desires and pains are generally found in children and women and servants, and in the free men so called who are of the lowest and more numerous class. Certainly, he said, whereas the simple and moderate desires which follow reason and are under the guidance of mind and true opinion are to be found only in a few, and those the best born and best educated. Very true. These two, as you may perceive, have a place in our state, and the meaner desires of the many are held down by the virtuous desires and wisdom of the few. That I perceive, he said. Then, if there be any city which may be described as master of its own pleasures and desires, and master of itself, Ours may claim such a designation? Certainly, he replied. It may also be called temperate, and for the same reasons? Yes. And if there be any state in which rulers and subjects will be agreed as to the question who are to rule, that again will be our state, undoubtedly. And the citizens being thus agreed among themselves, in which class will temperance be found, in the rulers or in their subjects? In both, as I should imagine, he replied. Do you observe that we are not far wrong in our guess that temperance was a sort of harmony? Why so? Why? Because temperance is unlike courage and wisdom, each of which resides in a part only, the one making the state wise and the other valiant. Not so temperance, which extends to the whole, and runs through all the notes of the scale, and produces a harmony of the weaker and the stronger and the middle class, whether you suppose them to be stronger or weaker in wisdom or power or numbers or wealth, or anything else. Most truly, then, may we deem temperance to be the agreement of the naturally superior and inferior, as to the right of rule of either, both in states and individuals. I entirely agree with you. And so, I said, we may consider three out of the four virtues to have been discovered in our state. The last of these qualities which make a state virtuous must be justice, if we only knew what that was. The inference is obvious. 
The time has then arrived, Glaucon, when, like huntsmen, we should surround the cover, and look sharp that justice does not steal away, and pass out of sight, and escape us. For beyond a doubt she is somewhere in this country. Watch, therefore, and strive to catch a sight of her, and if you see her first, let me know. Would that I could! But you should regard me rather as a follower, who has just eyes enough to see what you show him. That is about as much as I am good for. Offer a prayer with me, and follow. I will, but you must show me the way. Here is no path, I said, and the wood is dark and perplexing. Still we must push on. Let us push on. End of Book Four, Part One